Uh, good afternoon. May I have your attention, please? Uh, our speaker today is Cleve Moeller, the inventor of MATLAB. Uh, Cleve will tell us about how he came up with the idea and how it became what it is today. Uh, Cleve went to Caltech, where he studied mathematics, and then went on to get a PhD also in mathematics at Stanford. Uh, out of courtesy to our speaker, please uh, refrain from using laptops. Thank you. <laughs> I, I tried that in a course. I taught at UC Santa Barbara, and it was in a lab that was full of computers. And I thought everybody was using MATLAB, but uh, they weren't. <laughs> okay, thank you on the lights. Um, so I'm going to tell you, I'm going to mention our company logo uh, in when we get into the talk, but this is, it's really the solution to a partial differential equation, the wave equation. And this is showing the vibrations of an L-shaped membrane. Uh, Here's my business card. This is my company business card with the logo on it, except it really should look like this. So <laughs> I want to embed a MPEG player in my business card. To, OK. Um, so. Um, As kind of a, where's the, that's for later. As kind of a stunt, I, I don't use uh, PowerPoint. Uh, I'm, I'm, running, I'm running MATLAB here, uh, latest, latest version of MATLAB. And I have something called the MATLAB Presentation Viewer that exists only on this machine. This is never going to be a product. It doesn't actually work very well. <laughs> OK. So uh, this is what I'm going to use to give my talk. So I want to talk about the evolution of MATLAB. I'm going to try and talk here for a micro-century. A micro-century is the optimum. Well, today's Friday, but micro-century is actually good for a Tuesday, Thursday, no, Monday, Wednesday, Friday lecture. Anyway, it's 52.7 minutes. So uh, I will talk for a micro-century, and then we'll have questions as long as uh, you want to stick around. And uh, Have we got the auditorium the rest of the day? Do we? Sometimes, oh, I want to introduce Tim Matthew, who is the uh, uh, MathWorks representative here uh, that handles the accounts here at, at uh, Dartmouth. Uh, some of you know him already. If you have questions about licensing and so on, uh, check with Tim. I don't have anything to do with that. So. Uh, I want to go back to the very origins of, of, uh, of MATLAB way before MathWorks. MathWorks is now a little over 25 years old. Um, but the, my interest in this stuff goes back uh, to these three gentlemen, John Todd, George Forsyth, and J.H. Wilkinson, who were all mentors of mine. And I want to tell you a little bit about them. Um, here's J.H. Wilkinson in 1951 at the console of the Pilot Ace at the National Physical Laboratory in Teddington, England. This was the first computer built in England after the Second World War. Wilkinson actually wired, designed and wired the arithmetic unit, and then went on to become the world's leading, uh, leading expert on matrix computation. At about the same time, in Southern California, the National Bureau of Standards set up the uh, SWAC, the Standards Westerns Automatic Computer at UCLA and established the Institute for Numerical Analysis at UCLA. Here's pictures of the, in, the people at the Institute of Numerical Analysis, some famous people, Mark Koch, R Barclay Rosser, Magnus Hestenes, Wassow. But I'm interested in these three people, George Forsyth, Olga Towski Todd, and her husband John Todd is looking over the soldier, uh, looking over his shoulder. The Institute was 
dissolved around the uh, middle 50s in a scandal involving battery additives in the National Bureau of Standards, a fascinating story, but I don't have time to get into that. Uh, these people spread out around the world. Forsyth went to Stanford and the Todds went to Caltech. Here's the picture out of my yearbook from Caltech. This is the math faculty at Caltech in the late 50s. Ta Olga Towski was the first um, female full professor at Caltech. And again, uh, John Todd is in the background looking over his shoulder. Here's a clipping out of the Deseret News in Salt Lake City, Utah in 1957. They ran stories about precocious high school students. And here I am, it says I'm getting ready, getting, um, going off to Caltech. Oh, the resolution isn't quite good enough to read that thing, but it, showed, it shows uh, uh, electrons whirling about my head. I, um, I got admitted to Caltech because I was from Utah, and that was their idea of diversity back then. Um, I, uh, I took numerical analysis from John Todd, uh, one of the first time the course with that name was Todd Anyplace. We did our, our computing on this machine. This was the Burroughs 205 Datatron, one of about a dozen electronic computers in Southern California at the time. Uh, this was a vacuum tube machine. The, the cabinets back in here full of vacuum tubes. Um, we programmed an absolute numeric machine language, punched our programs on paper tape. This was a personal computer. Uh, only one person could use it at a time. <laughs> Filled the room, but we'd sign up for time at 2 o'clock in the morning. And I did a project under Todd on computing. Um, this is echoing, isn't it? Is it? You hear that echo that I hear? Uh, um, anyway, I started with matrix computation then. Uh, Todd suggested I go to Caltech, I'd go to Stanford for graduate school. George Forsyth was, I went there and worked with Forsyth. Forsyth was a math professor, but he was in the process of starting the computer science department at Stanford. So I was in on the ground floor of that, that department. Uh, we programmed in, did some work on the DEC PDP-1. Uh, this is DEC's first, first, first computer. It's there in the foreground. The tape drives for the 7090 are on the background. There was a console on this, a CRT on this machine, and some sense switches here that you could manipulate. And a guy named Steve Russell at MIT had programmed the world's first you're shaking your head. Do you know about? No, no. I thought you maybe knew about this. Uh, no. Uh, the um, program, one of the world's first video game. This is Space War. Uh, you could manipulate the sense switches and change the orientation and the thrust on these rockets. There's a sun in the middle that attracts the rockets, and you shoot missiles at the other at the other uh, rocket. Um, 1964 conference in, Ten in Gatlinburg, Tennessee on matrix computation. This is the organizing committee of that conference. And all six of these people had something important to do with the early, uh, in way with MATLAB, with matrix computation. Wilkinson, you may have heard of, I hope you've heard of, if you've studied numerical analysis, you've heard of Givens and Householder Transformations. Uh, and Rizzi was at the ETH in, in Zurich, had been at, at INA and UCLA. And Fritz Bauer from Munich uh, was a numerical analyst, but he was also instrumental in the development of the ALGOL 60 report, the ALGOL International Algebraic Language uh, in 1960. And that had a, quite an influence on development of MATLAB, as you'll see. Here's what I was saying about the uh, the L-shaped membrane. This was out of my thesis in 1965. We could only draw a two-dimensional contour with a uh, pen plotter then, but this has gone on to be our uh, MathWorks logo. If you drive east on Route 9 in Natick, you'll see it on a keep the highway 
clean sign. Um, Forsyth and I wrote, uh, we taught matrix computation, numerical analysis, and wrote this book. Uh, this was cited by the ACM as an important early textbook in computer science because it contained actual software. There are programs in ALGOL and FORTRAN and PL1 in this book for solving linear equations, and that becomes the backslash operator in, in MATLAB today. Uh, Wilkinson visited the United States every summer, taught a short course at the University of Michigan, and then went to Argonne Lab outside of, outside of Chicago, worked with the people there. Um, Wilkinson was doing work on matrix eigenvalue problems and algorithms for eigenvalue problems. Uh, he and several colleagues published their work as ALGOL programs in Numerisha, the journal Numerische Mathematik, and then Wilkinson and Reich collected those together in, in this book, uh, Householder and, and uh, Bauer were editors. Uh, people at Argonne translated um, Wilkinson's Algol into Fortran to make it more widely available, and that became IcePack for Eigen System Package. Here's uh, one of the two volumes of the user's guide. There was half a dozen people at Argonne worked on that, and then I visited Argonne in the summers, and so my name is on this as well. Uh, oh, that's oh, that's because I just gave a talk at Purdue. I threw this slide in. That was um, um, this was John Rice at Purdue, who organized an important uh, conference on math software that resulted in the basic linear algebra programs, the BLAS. Uh, those were used. The BLAS were used in LinPack. LinPack was is now known as a benchmark but it was originally a collection of software for doing uh, matrix computation that was developed uh, on summers at Argonne. Um, this is a matrix on the front cover. The inverse is on the back cover. If you get, if you get bored with the rest of the talk, you can invert this matrix and show it to me afterwards. I've never had, I say that in every talk, I've never had anybody take me up on it. Here's the authors of LINPAC. Um, Jack Dungara, uh, who's now a, a professor at the University of Tennessee. Me, Pete Stewart from the University of Maryland, and Jim Bunch from UC San Diego. This is Dungara's car, and he had a LINPAC license plate at the time. Um, this is Appendix 2 out of the back of the LINPAC ma uh, manual. This has now become the LINPAC benchmark. So there's listed here a couple dozen universities and national labs that we sent the programs to and asked them to run them, see if they worked, and also to time them. And here were the times it took to solve a 100 by 100 linear system on those machines. And then the columns scribbled in are Dungara's notation where he figured out the megaflops uh, of those machines. The fastest machine in the world at the time is at the top, the Cray-1 at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. It was doing 14 megaflops on a 100 by 100 system. 100 by 100 system is so trivial today that on my laptop I can't even time it. It takes just microseconds and the clock won't even time it. But back then it was about as big as we could do. In fact, the machine at the bottom, the, the deck 10 at Yale, didn't have enough memory to solve a 100 by 100 linear system. So we did a 75 by 75 linear system and multiplied by 4 thirds cubed uh, to put it on this chart. That's the beginning of the LINPAC benchmark. Um, today, that's, so now this is the basis for deciding the fastest machine in the world. It's called the top 500. Do I have a slide on that? I think this next slide says top 500. No. Anyway. So um, at, I'm, I go from here to New Orleans for the supercomputing conference, and there's going to be a session there where they announce the new top 500 list. 
And the fastest machine in the world as of the last day or two is a machine in China, actually. They've built this huge uh, parallel machine in China with, I, I'm pretty sure they have GPUs on this machine, each node of this machine, thousands of nodes, and they've taken over the lead from uh, Los Alamos and Oak Ridge become fastest machine in the world. And Dungara's involved in that, and Dungara's been all over the news in China uh, the last uh, week or so as this, this announcement was made. Um, I had moved to the university, moved from University of Michigan to the University of New Mexico by that time, and I was teaching numerical analysis and linear algebra. I wanted to have my students have access to LINPAC and ICEPAC without writing Fortran programs. So I read this book by Klaus Wirth. Wirth was later to go on and write Pascal, but this was kind of a predecessor of Pascal. I learned how to parse programming, parse computer languages from this book. He had a, he had a language called PL0 that he talked about in this book. So I wrote the first version of MATLAB in Fortran, starting about 19, starting in the late 70s. Uh, it was PL0 with, with matrix as the only data type. Um, here's some of the code for that. And it's Fortran code, about 3,000 lines of Fortran. And thanks to, I'm going to show that later. Thanks to, for, thanks to Microsoft and Intel, I can still run this on this machine. So this is the version of MATLAB uh, from the late 70s, actually compiled in 1984. I can type in a matrix. We used angle brackets back then. One, two, three, four, five, six. I'm not very good at typing in public. <laughs> Wolfram can give an entire hour talk without making a typing mistake. I can't do that. So there's a matrix. Uh, you could do matrix addition. There it is. You can multiply by scalars. Uh, that's the same thing. Uh, you can do matrix multiplication, A times A. And that's doing matrix multiplication like this. And then you can do array multiplication, a point times a. Uh, sorry, I won't do much typing. Sorry, I'll be more careful. And that multiplies each element by itself. Um, if I say uh, who, I get a list of the variables in my workspace. If I say what, List, list all the functions in the work, that's all the functions. That's all there was. There were 80 functions. This is a matrix calculator. It isn't a programming language. There's no M files, there's no toolboxes, no control theory, no FFT, no ODE solvers. It was just this very simple matrix calculator. Uh, you can also say why. And uh, <laughs> all right. And um, so that was handy. You can still say why in today's MATLAB. I'll come back and show you that later. Um, if I say um, it didn't know pi, so pi is four times the arctangent of one. And x is the numbers in 0 and steps of pi over 40 to 2 times pi. So that, um, I should, there's just a couple more. So it computes that, that what? What is that? It's a matrix. Everything's a matrix. This one has only one row and 81 columns, but that's all there is in MATLAB. And then y is x array multiplication of sine of 3 times x. And it evaluates that function at each element of the, of the vector. 
It's not like maple or mathematic. I do that symbolically. And now I'm ready to do graphics. So I can plot x comma y. And there it is. That's portable machine independent graphics uh, 30 years ago. That was it. That's the whole thing. You've seen a good part of the whole system here, just this simple matrix calculator, just the beginnings of graphics. I'll say exit. And uh, if you look quickly, it'll say adios, because it's from New Mexico. OK. I, I got to tell this one story. So how do you get out of MATLAB? Do you, how many people type exit? How many people type quit? Well, I took a survey around MathWorks one time. Did you type exit or quit? And I talked to uh, Damian Sheely, who was in charge of the graphics at the time. And I says, how do you get out of MATLAB? And he says, I type plot on my machine. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. Um, Oh, so I've got two MATLABs running because I want to show you something else later, and I didn't want to, I want to have trouble. Want to, didn't take the time to start it up. Um, so 1979 was an important development, a year for development. One of the things this was the when the first um, uh, Star Trek movie came out. Uh, here's Spock. Uh, oh, you can barely see that. Can you turn down the lights just for a minute? Anybody? Let me, where do I? Light control. So you can see that in the background. I, want, I don't want it completely dark. Anyway, it's, it's, so never mind. This isn't going to work. The resolution's too bad. Um, the producers of Star Trek needed graphics to run on the, all the scopes in the Enterprise. And they went to Los Alamos and got all the unclassified graphics that had been developed at Los Alamos. And I had worked on this piece of film for Los Alamos that showed um, that they got, and it's running on the scope in back, of, in back of Spock all throughout the movie. And if we zoom in on this, we can see a little, oh, that's too bad. OK, here's what's running on Spock's scope. It's actually the singular value decomposition. Here's a matrix which we're transforming to bidiagonal form and then diagonalizing the matrix. And that's what Spock is using to save the universe. <laughs> so this, the graphics wasn't actually done in MATLAB back then. It is being done here now. The computations were done in MATLAB and then a Los Alamos graphics program uh, was used to do the graphics. Um, what happened now? Where am I? I shouldn't have had these two things up. Eh. Well. So I'm back to the same thing now. What do I do to get rid of that? Type plot. Type plot. <laughs> That's what it's already type. So that's done. And I should go here and no. OK, I, this I got to get rid of. I told you this wasn't this thing wasn't Oh that's
Okay, so that number I'm typing is supposed to be what slide I'm, I'm at. And um, this is actually a new machine, and I'm not used to it. Um, okay, so 19, sorry about that. 1979 was also the year I visited Stanford on a sabbatical taught numerical analysis in the computer science department. Uh, half the students were graduate students in numerical analysis. They weren't very interested in MATLAB. They were kind of bored. It wasn't a programming language. It didn't, wasn't numerical analysis research. But the other half of the students uh, were students like you, students in engineering. And they'd used matrix notation in their, in their work, uh, in their textbooks, and then their thesis work. And they loved MATLAB. It could be done things used for work in control theory and signal processing, things I didn't know anything about. MATLAB hadn't been invented to do that. But the mathematics in MATLAB was just what they needed. Uh, they went off to a couple of companies in the Palo Alto area that did work on control theory. They used it and developed two commercial packages called Matrix X and Control C. You mentioned that some of you've used Control C. This was based on the Fortran MATLAB. Uh, these two guys were, these two companies were competitors with each other in the early 80s. The primary engineer behind, now what happened there? I didn't do that. Uh, I don't have any idea. So, um, the, um, no. Um, the um, there's a turn on. I, I'm sorry. I don't know what that. Still here out here. Can you see this? <laughs> um, the the primary developer of of uh, Control C was a, a Stanford uh, educated engineer named Jack Little. Um, Little got his degree. Little was working on, working on Control C. He graduated from Stanford a few years before. He didn't take my course, but a friend of his did, and he brought MATLAB uh, to Little. And Little saw it. Had been working in Fortran. Immediately started using MATLAB for his his control work. And then in in 1984. Uh, he came to me and said, 1983, uh, he said he wanted to uh, start a company uh, based on, yeah, we tried that, based on MATLAB. Uh, and, um, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the PC had just come out, and uh, Little uh, realized its potential, anticipated its potential in technical computing uh, that we have today. So he quit his job at SCT, went up to the hills behind Stanford, threw away all my Fortran, and together with a guy named Steve Bangert, re implemented MATLAB in C. Uh, and the um, three of us founded the MathWorks in California in 1984. Um, I had no idea that we were going to make a company out of this thing. Uh, Little uh, started the company, uh, was mainly interested in the software. Um, here's, he's, he did his development on this compact portable computer. At first it didn't have any, even have a hard drive. We had to, he had to flip um, floppies in and out. Uh, in 1984, uh, the MathWorks had two to the zero people, namely, namely Jack. And next year, he hired Bangert, so we had two to the one people. Um, it doubled. Here's a log plot of the size of MathWorks over the last 26 years. 
It's linear with slope one at the beginning. We doubled every year for the first seven years. If we kept that up, today we'd have 64 million people. <laughs> and uh, we'd have to hire 64 million more to double this year. So we've slowed down a bit. We have now something over 2,000 people, probably 2,200 people uh, around the world. Now let's see if I can get on to the next slide without... I've forgotten how to do that. What is it I have to do? What's... See, I don't have the... There it is. The reason I'm having trouble because this screen is not the usual resolution, and this thing is falling off the bottom of the screen. There was MathWorks in 1989 when we had two to the fifth people. Uh, here's me over on one side, Jack Little on the other. Uh, here's part of the company in, in Boston Convention Center a couple of years ago. Uh, here's our headquarters on Route 9 in Natick. Uh, here's the list of MATLAB versions uh, over the years. There's no, no explanation for the relationship between the version number and the year. Um, we're now at 7.11. I don't know when we'll get to 8. Uh, these numbers are way out of date, but the idea is that MATLAB today is a, is a complicated product. Uh, there's this companion product, Simulink, which I'll uh, uh, maybe try and show you. Um, and uh, uh, there are 80 or 90 toolboxes and Simulink block sets. There's tens of thousands of lines of code. Half of MATLAB is written in C, and half, half of it's written in the MATLAB language itself. Uh, increasing use of Java. When you're talking to the MATLAB command window, you're actually talking to a Java program. And then we've gone back to Fortran uh, for the linear algebra. The Fortran is the LA pack is the successor to LinPack and IcePack, and that's the basis for our matrix computation today. Um, so the, the essence of MATLAB, uh, the thing that's made it so popular, is this array-based programming language. Not so much matrices, but just arrays in general. The linear algebra is part of it, but not all of it. The mathematics is there, the matrix computation, the ordinary differential equations, and then, and then the graphics. Those are the three parts that make the essence of MATLAB. Um, originally, I wrote it to be interactive. I got tired of going down to the computer center after dinner to pick up my output and so on, or time sharing system, but I made this interactive MATLAB. Today that's taken for granted on machines like laptops and, and personal workstations, where it is where you have where you're the only one using it. But it's not true in the large shared systems, which you where where you can have dozens of users. And these are these are batch, still batch oriented. You maybe get your output back fast, but it's not interactive. This is one of the frustrations I've had with, with supercomputing. This is going to come up next week in, in New Orleans. So MATLAB's historical and intellectual basis is, is the numerical linear algebra where I got started. Um, but its commercial success derives from its applications in, in technical computing in many of the kinds of things that most of you, I think, are interested here, because I'm visiting an engineering school. Um, and let me tell you about it, just about a few of those. Um, here's a picture that was taken in the garage at MathWorks a couple weeks ago. This is a Chevrolet, except there's a cord coming out of it. This is the Chevrolet Volt that was visiting, visiting MathWorks a few weeks ago. Um, this is a, a more, this is an official picture, picture off the General Motors website of the Volt with the, with the charging cable coming out of it. Um, this is a complicated piece of machinery, and 
all the control software, all the electronics that goes into this, into this vehicle was developed using MATLAB and Simulink. Um, not, not, the f not the structural crashworthiness, not the flow over the hood, but all the electronics inside. This, machine, this vehicle has, I don't know, a few dozen microprocessors in it and all the control systems, the brakes, the window, and then the switching back and forth between the, the uh, engine and the motor are all done with Simulink. And um, I was going to try and show you that. Uh, let me, let me, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I don't know Simulink. Anybody, how many people here have used Simulink? Yeah, I didn't think so. So um, this is, uh, or I thought, but not very many. Um, so Simulink is a graphics-based programming language where you hook together blocks that represent components in the system, and the flow between the blocks is control signals or voltages or velocities. And to the, to the systems engineer, uh, it's this, this block diagram. Uh, to me, it's a solution of ordinary, it's a system of ordinary differential equations. But um, uh, the people that are using it uh, might not think of it that way. Here's another, another vehicle uh, which is designed using Simulink. And the engineers designing cars or tilt rotor aircraft today sit at computer terminals like all the rest of us run simulations of their part of the device, and then emit code that's actually going to be used in the control processor uh, on the machine. This is a very complicated three-dimensional control problem, keeping this thing in the air. This thing is now undergoing certification by the CAA and is supposed to fly next year. Maybe, uh, maybe the, uh, there's, an, there's an airport here, right? Maybe this, uh, we'll just start using this, uh, this kind of airport is a good place for it. Um, uh, space vehicles, so the first, the first uh, system to leave the solar system had simulink generated code on it. Uh, semiconductor design, here now you simulate the device and then you can generate the, um, VHDL that's used to actually uh, build the device. Um, my wife was looking for a hearing aid for her mother. She says, hey, Cleve, here's a MATLAB plot on this website. I says, come on now. And I went, it is. So this is a, a hearing aid company in Denmark, and there's a surf plot uh, on their home page. Uh, there's a dozen hearing aid companies in the world. And all of them use MATLAB uh, in the development, the signal processing that goes on in the hearing aid, and also sophisticated models of the, the ear itself. Uh, image, I've been talking to people here today about image processing, uh, 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 very important uh, business for us. Um, mathematical finance, uh, the um, the Wall Street and financial companies around the world uh, use all kinds of software, not just MATLAB, but anything you can get their hands on to uh, model uh, the prices of exotic financial instruments. Um, bioinformatics and, and biosimulation, we're trying to help take what we know about engineering systems and apply it to biological systems. The biology people have the same block diagrams with, with lines between them, except now the blocks mean proteins, and the lines maybe, maybe mean chemical reactions. Again, it's a system of ordinary differential equations, mathematically, uh, but the interpretation is quite different. Bioinformatics is a different subject. That's, um, uh, you know, gene, gene sequencing, the study of sequences of CTG and A. Um, MATLAB is not much used in mathematics. 
I like to say that mathematics is the art of avoiding computation. If you have a mathematical model that requires computation, it's too complicated. Uh, but in, in numerical mathematics, MATLAB is widely used. And I've written a couple books that are available on the web uh, for use in, in uh, numerical methods classes. And then as a, as a former professor and occasional visiting professor, I'm very proud of the role we play in institutions like this, uh, where, where MATLAB uh, plays an important part of the education, uh, the education system. Um, here's, a, here's a list of some websites. How many people here, I've met a couple people today who've been involved with MATLAB Central. Who knows about MATLAB Central? Ah, that's a pretty typical response. This, this is a, a website where there are contributed, contributed software. So it's thousands of programs uh, written by MATLAB users around the world, and also a system for asking questions about MATLAB. So uh, if you're interested in MATLAB, take a look at MATLAB Central. It's like the web itself. Some of the stuff on there is junk. Some of it's really, really valuable. Uh, you have to fend, fend for yourself. Uh, then the website where the, I have my books. I love this quote from Jim McClellan, a double E professor at Georgia Tech. The reason why MATLAB is so good at signal processing was not designed for signal processing. It was designed to do mathematics. This is what I love. I mean, just today, I've gone around and met people here and learned about all kinds of things that MATLAB uh, is used for. Uh, brain imaging, uh, computer security. It's fascinating uh, what, uh, what people have found to do with MATLAB, and I really enjoy hearing about it. Um, I, I, we, we, now have, we now have a parallel computing. One of, one of the articles, one of the papers I'd written the most widely say, cited was a paper I wrote several years ago about why there isn't a parallel MATLAB. Uh, and the, at the time, there was the business model was wrong, the memory model was wrong. But today, we have a parallel computing toolbox. It's being um, further developed every year. This will be a big topic uh, at the supercomputing conference next, next week. We're doing joint, we're cooperating with Microsoft, for example, in their efforts in high performance computing uh, is, is uh, based to some extent on MATLAB. So we'll hear about that next week. Um, so there's a couple of levels of kind of computing, parallel computing. On one chip, we have to worry about multi-core and multi-threaded libraries. We can do that through the libraries, the, math, the Intel math kernel library um, provides multi-threaded linear algebra, and we've done some of that ourselves. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, there's, there's very coarse grain, many computers hooked together. Here we, don't, here we run many MATLABs, and they sit on this system waiting for work, and we find many people are doing um, embarrassingly parallel. Uh, parameter suites, Monte Carlo, uh, you called it poor man's parallel. Poor man's parallel. Uh, we have provision for distributed arrays and for uh, communication between the workers, but that's not used very much. The individual machines have become so powerful and have so much memory that they can do a huge amount of work by themselves. And so now what you do is, is do a whole bunch of interest, uh, instances of one function. That's the most popular use of, of parallel MATLAB. Um, I want to show you this, because this is kind of fun. We'll end up with this. Uh, Nicholas Troje is a, is a professor, used to be in, 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 in Germany, is now at Queen's University, Ontario. I've never met him, but I've talked to him on the phone and had email correspondence. He's interested in human gait, and he's particularly interested in how 
how humans recognize what other people are doing by the way they walk. And he, for, for a number of years, in Germany, he had a motion capture system. Um, this, was a, this was several years ago. We just saw, my wife and I watched Avatar the other night. And of course, Avatar is, is based on a much more sophisticated version of this kind of thing. And this is now very popular in Hollywood. But you have sensors placed on the body or on the face, and you capture their motion as they go through um, some kind of movement. Uh, Troje took a number of subjects. He had 60, well, yeah, one subject. He'd put one of his students, one of his grad students, on a treadmill and get him walking. And when he got at an even pace, he'd turn on the equipment and take uh, several seconds of motion um, at 120 frames per second. Uh, there were 15 markers on the body. Each of those is moving in three dimensions. So he gets 45 functions of time um, for one subject. So the raw data has 45 rows and a couple of thousand columns. Uh, he then, oh, that's not, oh, well, anyway, uh, font's wrong there. Um, he then has this model. He wants to do model reduction. So he's going to take this data and reduce it to five terms. This five-term Fourier series, uh, omega, or W in this font, is a scalar frequency which is computed using the FFT. And then the five Vs are vectors. Vectors that are coefficients, but they're vectors with 45 components. So capital V is a, is a 45 by 5 coefficient matrix, and he's going to take his raw data and reduce it to just five components with a technique called principal component analysis or singular value decomposition. This is what was going on in Spock's scope as he saved the universe. Um, but uh, uh, Troji is using it, uh, her little more mundane task here. So he then, he has 60 subjects. And um, I think it's 60, we'll see in a minute, maybe 80. 80, it says there. So he has 80 subjects. He takes the 80 sets of coefficients he has for those subjects and does principal component analysis now for the whole batch and gets one set of principal components that he calls the eigenwalker. Um, where's, there's supposed to be a little, see I'm on the wrong font here. Um, oh, okay. So here are six of his subjects. We're just playing back the data here. There's no simulation. There's no physics. Well, we're paying back just the five components of that series, which capture about 95, 97% uh, of the motion. And if you look at the series, it's just a matrix of numbers, but if you plot them this way, you can see how these, how these people are walking. Um, here's some more. Right. All with German names here. Um, poor Jamie down the lower right-hand corner was having a bad day. <laughs> But how do we know that? This is what Troji's interested in. How do we look at that and recognize the emotion of this person from, from his walk? Right? Um, so, what, we give it to my two favorites here. Yeah, Pablo and Patricia. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, um, we'll get back to them in a minute. <laughs> so here's the eigenwalker. Here's the average. This is the first component. This is the average over all time and all subjects 
of that motion, and this is just showing the static motion. We can then turn on V2. Oh, let's get it back there. So this gives us the, the basic component of the walk. V3 gives it a little more character. And then when we turn on V4 and V5, we get a pretty, uh, a pretty, it's flashing on that screen, but we get a pretty nice walk out of that. Right? Now, um, half the subjects were male and half were female. But you can't see that from the principal component analysis. The principal component analysis doesn't, when the components come out, they're just called V1, V2, V3. These names down at the bottom we made up, but there's none of them that says this is the gender. But you can do what statisticians call classification. You can take half the students were male, you compute their coefficients. Half the students were female, you compute their set of coefficients, and then you can take a new subject and see which set it's closer to. So we can turn on that difference. Now this is all the subjects of one, all the subjects of one gender. The animation people have learned that it's important to overemphasize emotion. So if we multiply the difference by three, we get the motion, we get the emphasized gender. Now I haven't told you what gender that is, but you can all pretty well see. I can go over here. <laughs> That's the governor of California. <laughs> uh, and if we can see what, what the difference is, we can turn off these other components. Oops, getting walking backwards. All right, and then do this. It's all in the elbows. All right. So, again, there's no simulation here. It's just play, the principal component analysis, the only mathematical computation there. I'd love to write uh, a simulation of this that would capture, what is it about the motion that we can capture? What are the differential equations here that's describing, describing this motion? Troji is interested in how we recognize this. So you go to Troji's web page, and he has a bunch of things. He asks you to participate in an experiment where he has moving dots, and then you're supposed to click whether you think it's male or female. And he's collecting data about how good people are at recognizing gender from the motion, right? and all this work is done in MATLAB, and that's a that's a um, uh, a good uh, way to end the formal part of the lecture. So uh, I'm, I said I'd take a microcentury. That's about it. Thank you very much. Now, I'm, I'm glad to sit here and, and take questions. Sometimes we get a lively discussion. Uh, I invite questions, and I invite those of you that uh, have someplace else to go to uh, leave at your leisure. So thanks very much. All right. Yes. So George asked about where we're growing. Um, we have work to do in all the areas where we're strong already. You know, we need more image processing. Uh, we need more data acquisition. Uh, these, are, these are all important areas to us. Uh, the mathematics remains at the core. The matrix computation, differential equations are part of all this stuff. But as a percentage of our overall work, it's becoming smaller as we get off into other areas. Uh, the biology, biomedical, is a huge untapped area where we've just scratched the surface. Um, the discussion today, everybody here wants to talk about GPUs. 
And can we figure out how to use these things? Uh, the latest, does this, does this work? Let me, I don't even decide. This might not work. Um, well, okay. Anyway, so we have something called GPU array in the latest MATLAB, which creates an array on the GPU, but there's not much you can do with it yet once it's over there. So that's something we have to develop. Um, so multi-core, forget about GPUs. How do we just use the, all these cores on these machines? Uh, that's something we're, we're, um, we, we're beginning to develop. Um, one, of the, one of the ways we use multi-core is, for example, optimization global optimization, where we have to evaluate a MATLAB function at a whole, points, a whole bunch of points, we can just put several MATLABs to work doing, doing function evaluation for global optimization or for numerical comp computation of a Jacobian. We, it's that level of granularity that's probably uh, the minimum for, for multi-core. And then this embarrassing the parallel stuff, we just do a bunch of separate computations. Uh, that we've already got, but there's nothing much to programming that. So all these areas. I to told some of you earlier today that maybe one of our biggest compar competitors is Excel. So all kinds of people that are doing um, slightly sophisticated numerical computations, scientific computations in Excel. Uh, how do we get them uh, using MATLAB? Um, yeah. Yes. In mathematical, is there an effort to increase our popularity in finance? Um, sure. Uh, we have a team working on finance, st finance stuff. The trouble is the the finance people are very very secretive about what they're doing. They're they're even more secretive than Los Alamos. Um, so. They, you know, if we had a, if we had a tool that pretended to pick stocks or price derivatives, no one would no one would use it. They wouldn't believe it in the first place, and and second of all, I mean, if, if it worked, then everybody'd use it, so you'd have no advantage. So I don't think we try and and do things at that level, but we want we want to do is provide. Uh, provide the tools that people that do do these kind of computations can go off to their um, hideaways and program their own stuff. So we have lots of, lots of, lots of basic operations for finance calculations. Uh, you know, a calendar that has only 360 days in the year, because that's, you know, done in four quarters. Uh, how many business days are there between now and Christmas? Uh, those that that's very primitive kind of stuff. Um, this um, global optimization. Once had somebody said, asked me, he says, "Do you have a function that will find the global optimum of a discontinuous function of 52 variables?" And I said, "No." And they said, "We didn't think you did." <laughs> And uh, but 52, where does that come from? That's finance, right? So uh, yeah, yes. My day-to-day -day life. Well, the chairman is is a kind of honorary, nominal title. We're not a publicly traded company, so. Um, our annual board meeting is actually going to be three days before Christmas, and I'm going to be in Australia talking to him on the cell phone. So we'll have about 10 minutes of board meeting. Um, so I, I'm not involved in the day-to-day -day operation. I live in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where I get to work on, on, um, uh, on fun stuff. Uh, so here's a book I'm working on called Experiments in MATLAB. 
that has, these are different icons for different fun things that uh, I'm trying to do it at, at, a, at a more elementary level. Here's one of my favorite ones. Let me just show you this one. So this is a plot. The blue line is a plot of 2 to the t. Right? As t run, runs from 1 to 2, 2 to the t runs from 1 to 4. The green line is its slope. The slope is computed just by taking differences at nearby points. And we see that the slope is the same shape. The green line is the same shape as the blue line, but it's below it. Now I can grab this and move the blue line. And here's the plot of 3 to the t. The green line is now above the blue line, still the same shape. So I want to move it until the green line is just exactly on top of the blue line. And there I have it. All right, And I've discovered the function that's its own slope. And that's e to the t. I've discovered e here and computed it. It's very important that that be interactive, that I drag the blue line with the mouse. I can't do that on the supercomputers, because they're not interactive. I don't need the supercomputers. Right? So if I can get this kind of thing into, say, the beginning, beginning course in, in computing for engineers at Dartmouth, I'd, I'd love to do that. If I could get it into high schools, for bright students in high schools, I'd love to do that. So um, that's, the kind of, that's the kind of thing I enjoy working on. And that's called Experiments in MATLAB, and it's, uh, it's on our website. Right. What? Oh, keyboard. Can I? So do you know how the 12th root of 2 is involved here? How many people know about the 12th root of 2? Good. So an octave is divided into 12 semitones. You advance multiplicity, multiplicatively. So to go from one semitone to the next one, you multiply the frequency by the 12th root of 2. Right? Now, I'd, I'd love to be able to make this thing play chords, but I, you can't do two mouse clicks at once or three mouse clicks at once. I can't attach a MIDI keyboard to this thing, because not everybody has a MIDI keyboard. So that's, that's, something, I'm, that's something I'm thinking about. Yes? That's right. Well, that's what I want to talk about. What's the mathematics between the well-tempered system and, and, the, and the, what's the other one called, where you have the perfect harmonics? Yeah. That's right. That's, that's what I'd like to talk about. So I, there's a whole terminology there that I'm just learning. And, uh, and it, it, there's some interesting mathematics going on there. Right. Here's one. Do you know about this? Here's how it, here. So here's how a touch tone phone works. So as you move across a row, so the signal is the sum of two signals, two perfect signs with incommensurate frequencies. So a one is sine of 697 plus 1209. As you move across the row, one of the frequencies changes, but the other doesn't. As you move down a column, the other frequency changes. So the keyboard here is a matrix. There we go. That's a, so. There we go. I learned how to do that. Um, so the keyboard here is a matrix, and the row and column indices indicate what the frequencies are. Um, so that's how you generate tones. That's a synthesis of touch tone phone. Here is a recording of me dialing a number. So 
So what number is that? Here's the FFT of that signal. And we see 12, uh, seven peaks at the seven different frequencies involved in the, in the touch tone dialing. But if I just take one digit and do its FFT, I can see just two peaks. And I can take that and correlate it with this. And from the FFT, I can discover that's a one, all right? There's a five. And this is, in fact, the fax number for MathWorks. Uh, the last digit and the first digit are both ones. This is, this is the world's most used algorithm. Every time any place, anybody in the world dials a touchtone phone, you have to do this to recognize uh, what number is being dialed. More interesting mathematics there. Can I get that to high school students? At least the first half. The second half involves finite Fourier transforms. That's getting a little, a little iffy, I think. Yes? I knew it. I worked with a guy one time. He could sing. Sing those tones. Yeah. <laughs> there used to be an advice called the blue box, which was a, a tone synthesizer that would dial the phone so you could bypass the billing system on the, on, the, on the phone system. And that's how the two Steves, Jobs and Wozniak, got their start in electronics, was, was building blue, blue, uh, blue boxes. I understand. That's alleged. Yes? Get a Windows machine. <laughs> I, you know, we dropped years ago. We dropped the Mac for for about five years because we were pretty sure they were going out of business. Um, they didn't, but it it wasn't so much because of their computer work, but as other works. Uh, Linux has not taken over the world, uh, so it's. I don't know what the numbers are. Do you too? Uh, I'm not sure what they are, but but Windows is huge, huge fraction. So you haven't seen any recent changes? I haven't watched. I don't I don't see those numbers, and I don't pay much attention to them. Um, I um, I mean I was a Linux user for a long time, and then I got to Windows, and for my birthday. A few weeks ago, my wife gave me this thing, and um, here is the MATLAB icon. Uh, this MATLAB doesn't run on this machine, but here is a potentially an interface to MATLAB running on a server someplace like the Amazon Cloud. Uh, what is this machine? Is this, what is this thing running? Is it running Linux? What? iOS. What is that? I don't know. OK. <laughs> yeah? OK. OK. So um, yeah, I mean, this is, this is a, an important development. Um, Samsung came out with their alternative to this today. This thing, this thing won't run MATLAB. Right? Uh, it's not powerful enough, doesn't have enough memory to run in MATLAB. But where do these go? Um, I've never been a big Mac user. Uh, the company was. We used to run the company on Macs. But there's some things I like about this thing that are they're very nice. So. All right, well, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much.